Hello and welcome to this Serial Geek TV episode commentary for Colossal Awakes, an episode of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe produced by Filmation Studios. Colossal Awakes, or as I like to refer to it, the episode where so much happens at such a fast pace that you can be forgiven for forgetting who is doing what. But seriously though, this episode, one of the earliest in the series, is utterly packed with material. It's a prime example of an action-adventure episode. Laser beams, stone warriors, stone giants, heroes, villains, heck, even Panthor makes an appearance in this episode. Oh, quick, utterly pointless side story, <laughs> so you know it's going to be worth it. As a kid, I would often purchase my action figures from our local toy shop, Jennings, in Enfield. Goodness, how I would love to go back in time right now. It was a literal treasure trove of toys back then. However, one memory I have is of my father and I going to our local Tesco's, which actually wasn't that local, and buying Panthor. The reason I bring this up is that Tesco was a place where you would buy food, not really a place where one would pick up a purple flocked fighting tiger. Actually, thinking about it as I say this, I do remember buying Smokescreen, the Transformer there too. So Panther was one of the few toys that I didn't buy in Jennings. I was very loyal to Jennings. So yeah, this episode, one of the earliest produced for the series, so early in fact that at this point, in this very episode, the evil warriors were still known as the evil masters of the universe. We'll get to that in a little moment when the time comes. The episode script was written on December the 10th, 1982 and revised three times with the final script being ready on July the 12th, 1983. It would air in the UK on January the 30th, 1984, making it the 8th episode to air in my neck of the woods. I think the reason that this episode is so widely remembered is that it was one of the three that was used in the director video movie The Greatest Adventures of All, which, it should be noted, was shown as a premiere at the Man's Chinese Theatre in Los Angeles on September the 24th, 1983, two days before the series debuted in the US on the 26th of December. That video was such a big seller for RCA and later Magic Window. These days, from what I've seen online, it's one of those VHS tapes that goes for a lot of money in good condition. Even though it's volume four, there's just something very special about it. Interestingly, it was released as the first ever He-Man VHS tape over here in the UK by Select Video. And given that the special acts as an introduction to the series, I'm thankful that it does appear on volume one. I should start off by talking about the visuals to this episode. There's something unique about them that you only kind of realise when you take a step back or if, like me, you were lucky enough to go inside the old Filmation warehouse and go through folders upon folders of production material for this particular episode. As you may have seen many years ago, I made a video on the official He-Man YouTube channel in which I talked about Bob Klein. I've mentioned him numerous times on this channel and will continue to do so. Bob Klein was a supremely talented artist, and still is from what I've seen, and in the 80s he was celebrated by many of his colleagues. I'm not joking, people that worked with him were fans of his because his work was just incredible. Bob was responsible for the staging of the transformation sequence, actually we're about to see it. His staging for the transformation sequence first appeared in the storyboards for Diamond Ray of Disappearance and was Xeroxed by other artists in order to show the sequence in their own boards. So yeah, the transformation sequence from Prince Adam's almost famous initial pose, the unsheathing of the Sword of Power, the camera pan up to the sword, the shot of Adam He-Man with the image of Castle Grayskull appearing behind him. Originally, Bob Klein wanted the castle to appear at only 50%, so it would almost be a ghostly image over whatever background our hero was standing on. But yeah, the sword held across his chest, the camera pan when He-Man points the sword to Cringer, the cowardly cat shaking, it's all there in Klein's initial storyboard take on the transformation. Sadly for Filmation, he moved to Marvel production during the series, and so we only ever have him working on a few things for the show. One of those things he did was illustrate layouts for this episode. Now, what are layouts I hear you ask? Well, first the script is written, then the episode is storyboarded. The layout process comes next. Layout artists would frame the shots and illustrate how the characters should look and stage their direction. A character walks into shot, a character jumps, a character picks something up, you get the idea. Storyboards in general could be rough or feature characters whose design was yet to be finalised at the time, so the layouts had the characters looking more on model and would help the animator and director understand what is happening in a particular shot. 
Layer artwork was often a mixed bag. Sometimes an artist would look at the storyboard and create a very flat, simple looking layout, or they would save time by taking a nicely illustrated shot in the storyboard and refer to a piece of stock instead. The reason I bring all of this up is that Bob Klein was the layout artist on this episode, so the visuals are something rather special. Yes, stock sequences appear, of course they do, but a lot of the shots throughout this episode are unique, and if you look at certain cells, you can see that the characters aren't always on model, not in a bad way as is normally the case, but there's a certain comic book rendering throughout this episode. One thing I have seen is that the animators on this episode actually traced Bob Klein's layouts in the sense that they used his strong drawings as key frames for their animated sequences. To say this was rare at Filmation would be an understatement. Layouts were just a point of reference for the animators and rarely, if ever, traced when animating. The way I found this fact out is that Bob Klein's layouts for this episode were all done in red pencil, and so some of the production line artwork, when you look at the reverse of the drawing, you can see red pencil marks where Klein's artwork was traced. <laughs> it's brilliant. So yeah, you'll notice in certain shots of this episode, He-Man looking very heroic. His heroic chin and dimple seem to get more screen time than ever in Colossal Awakes. And yeah, we have the stone statues coming to life. Of course, the lion most famously being Jad Beljar from Filmation's Tarzan cartoon. That down shot of He-Man and Teela and the Wind Raider, again, that's pure Bob Klein. Rather than just using a static two shot, he uses a down shot and it looks so much better. It's a shame that that shot is never used again in the series. And now the Wind Raider is put out of action. Skeletor's Collector, this being its first appearance, does a good deal of damage. But you're about to see with this action scene that there are so few stock motions. Even when Ram Man bounces into action, it's not a stock sequence. A convenience pot plant there for Stratos to use against his enemy. You think a statue wouldn't be felled by a uh, pot plant? Look at this animation of Ram Man. That is gorgeous, the way he crouches down and springs into flight. Utterly fantastic. This coming up near final shot with... Orko's little victory. Yeah! You know, I could probably make a video essay just about the unique visuals of this episode, covering a variety of shots and stages, given that I have both the script and the storyboard. I've never really noticed it before, but in that final shot in which Stratos, Ram Man and Orko celebrate, Ram Man is actually illustrated much like his original model sheet. In his near final design, he was actually pretty much the same height as He-Man. But a last minute decision was made to reduce the springs in his legs. I think it went from five or six on show to just three, reducing his height dramatically. This may have been done for comedic purposes or just to make him look more sturdy. And now here we are back in the laboratory with a stone man at arms. He was always getting himself frozen in some way, wasn't he? I say that I'm remembering the dragon's gift and this episode. I mean, he was frozen in the region of ice also and I bet there are one or two more. That said, people being frozen or turned into statues happened a lot in cartoons of the 1980s. I always laugh at how Queen Marlena's Earth Science determines that man arms will be permanently stone come sundown. Here we are at the ancient ruins, a beautifully rendered location. Just look at the detail of these backgrounds. Sadly, this setting would be used a few times over the series, most notably in Origin of the Sorceress as Dark Mountain, and the episode One for All as some prehistoric ruins. So the mighty Colossal. Look where the positioning of Colossal's eye is here. In the original layouts and the design of the character, Klein had the eye on the stone that appears to be his nose, and the more prominent stone was his brow, and I think it actually looks better that way. If I recall, in one or two shots in this episode, you do see the eye in the original place. Oh, before I forget, this scene with He-Man and Battle Cat at Castle Greyskull was originally going to take place within the Sorceress's laboratory, which we see later in the episode. Also in the script, the laboratory is beautifully described by writer J. Bryn Stevens. She writes, The laboratory is an interesting mix of technology and magic. Long, shiny tables holding retorts and alembics are surrounded by skulls, coloured candles and ancient-looking scrolls. On one wall hangs a mirror. Instead of a reflection of the lab, it shows us a swirling coloured mist. And the mirror was actually going to play a part in the sorceress delivering He-Man's mission to retrieve the fire jewels. I mentioned a race against time and oh boy, are we going to go to some locations. Think about the script for this episode. We start off at Snake Mountain, then we're at the Royal Palace, then we're inside the Royal Palace, still good. Then, in this order because you best believe I wrote it down, 
we have the ancient ruins, Castle Greyskull, some farmland, the royal palace, the misty swamps, the volcano that houses the fire jewels, then we're back at the ancient ruins, then we're back at the cavern, then we're back at the ancient ruins, then we're inside Castle Greyskull, then He-Man storms the collector, then we're at the royal palace once again, then Castle Greyskull where the final battle takes place, and then finally, 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 the royal palace. It's crazy, so crazy that Warren Greenwood in his storyboard actually drew a screen direction map in order to figure out where everything is and in which direction the collector should be flying when it's going from one place to the next. I'm not kidding either, I've never ever seen that in another storyboard. Oh, in this episode we get that cameo by Evil Lynn in which she talks about usurping Skeletor's power. And we still have Beastman acting as if he wants to seize Skeletor's power for himself. You can tell that this was indeed a script written in late 1982, just as the series was entering production. Numerous times in this episode, Beastman questions Skeletor's plan, goading him into losing his call. Even though he is continually bossed around by Skeletor, Beastman is not once written to look like a bumbling oaf in the eyes of the viewer. Talking about Warren Greenwood's storyboards, Greenwood was very prominent during production of He-Man. His storyboards have a style that is rather hard to describe, very off-model to the point where sometimes characters aren't really wearing the costumes we know them to be depicted in. And he would rarely draw eyes, just very odd triangles that were shaded black. I mean, there was no mistaking his storyboards, they definitely stood out. His storyboards for the episode Ordeal in the Darklands are a thing of beauty. Sadly, that episode doesn't see his visuals realised. Warren Greenwood is probably best known for writing a certain much celebrated episode of season two, the fantastic Star Trek inspired The Arena. And now the heroes are at the volcano. Originally, when journeying to seek the fire jewels, He-Man, Teela and Battlecat in the attack track traversed the geyser field, the same one seen in the episode A Friend in Need. The attack track was damaged in this scene, forcing the heroes to ride on battle cap the rest of the way. I think it would have been nice to have seen that location again, especially the danger it presented. Another scene removed for time or because it was really odd that was going to take place would see He-Man encounter a huge snake guarding the altar. I'll try and explain the scene as best I can because even reading the scene back it's hard to visualise. The horned snake creature would be wrapped around the large pile of glowing jewels. Its tail said to be much like that of a rattlesnake, but the noise it was to make wasn't a rattle, but rather wind chimes. Okay. <laughs> He-Man, with the sword of power drawn, was going to walk up to the altar, causing the snake to rear back as if it were about to strike. Next, He-Man was to hold the sword in front of himself, vertically, and slowly begin to wave it back and forth. The sword of power was then going to glitter, Yes, glitter, that's the word used in the script. And with that, the snake basically becomes hypnotized by He-Man for a brief moment. I will say, as interesting as that scene would have been, I'm very glad they removed it. And here we are, Colossor lives and act one ends. And act two begins with a rather beautifully animated lava sequence. Of course, one could argue that lava shouldn't move that fast, but meh. Yeah. Again, looking at this sequence in which He-Man has to catapult himself over the lava, all these key frames, all these extreme movements are taken purely from Bob Klein's layout artwork. His extreme movements are very comic book-like and not always something we would get in the He-Man series, unfortunately. And yes, of course, we get a stock sequence with He-Man landing in shot. So yeah, we're about to hear Skeletor converse with Colossal for the first time, and you'll hear Skeletor refer to himself as a master of the universe. Listen. I, Skeletor, master of the universe, have awakened you, and I command you, capture Castle Grayskull. As I've talked about before, probably in some videos already, the evil warriors were originally going to be known as the evil masters of the universe. The series, in some early promotional artwork, was titled He-Man and Masters of the Universe, in the sense that it was He-Man against all those whom desired power. Very much at the 11th hour this was changed, and the Masters of the Universe became a generic term. In the cartoon, it most certainly did not apply to the heroes, and when I was young I always assumed that the masters of the universe were those that desired the power, even though many other canons of the time, mini comics, annuals, UK comics, referred to the heroes as the masters of the universe. As I've said before, I always thought masters of the universe was far too self-congratulatory a term for the heroes to use. Yeah, we're the masters of the universe. 
<laughs> yeah, and a few scripts. This one, like Father Like Daughter, you'll hear references to the villains being called the Masters of the Universe. Interestingly, the script requests that Skeletor's line about him being a master of the universe, in reference to the original term used for the evil warriors, be changed to soon to be master of the universe in attempt to justify the line. However, the change wasn't made, and I'm glad. To me, the evil warriors will always be the masters of the universe. In that previous scene, we saw the heroes in the sorceress's laboratory, with the guardian of Castle Greyskull creating a device which can stop the Collector's dominance over Eternia. The odd thing, let's think about this for a second, the heroes have no way of knowing what the interior of the Collector even looks like, let alone the controls. So how in the hell does He-Man know that this device will perfectly fit over the two levers when he's never even seen that the Collector has two levers? It's bizarre. Interesting to see Beastman flying the Collector. That didn't happen too often in the series. It was always pretty much skeletal behind the controls. I should mention that in the script there were shots of the setting sun, emphasising the heroic warrior's race against time. I think this would have been a really nice touch, but given the back and forth quick fire nature of this episode, it probably would have just made the busy visuals even busier. This action scene coming up is so fantastic, again staged perfectly by the layout artwork of Bob Klein, working from Warren Greenwood's storyboards, but there was something very very special. Just look at the image of He-Man when he lands on top of the Collector. The detail in the animation as he tears the hull of the ship. It looks great. Almost like with a smile on his face. He-Man lands in shot and the villains immediately go into action. This sequence of Beastman just beautifully animated. We get a use of stock there where He-Man picks up Beastman and throws him, unfortunately. Hey look, it's Panthor, a toy, as I mentioned earlier, that I randomly purchased in Tesco. Very interesting moment here in which the sorceress's telepathy actually endangers the life of He-Man as Skeletor uses the distraction to push the most powerful man in the universe towards the opening in the Collector. You can survive a fall from this height, He-Man! I would have to, Skeletor. This shot of He-Man and Skeletor is just so iconic, it's a wonderful image. I've seen Bob Klein's layout artwork for that shot and it's just beautiful. And He-Man puts the little device on Skeletor's controls. Isn't it amazing how it just fit? <laughs> I always find that shot amusing. Skeletor elbows Beastman out of the way and then in the following shot he's kind of reaching out to him, almost seeing if he's okay. I didn't mean to elbow you Beastman. I should say that this episode does a fantastic job of showcasing just how big Colossal is. Numerous cartoons, including He-Man and She-Ra, would sometimes fumble the ball when it came to depicting giants. They would either move too quickly or too slowly, but Colossal Awakes does a wonderful job of keeping this giant, well, a giant. He has real weight to him, real presence. The camera shakes when he moves. And now we're back at the Royal Palace. A scene deleted here that I would love to have seen saw King Randall and Stratos lining up all the statues in the palace courtyard, ready for Skeletor's next attempted attack. I just think that would have been a rather amusing visual seeing King Randall and Stratos carrying Ram Man across the courtyard. <laughs> but yeah, we're back at the Royal Palace. This episode really does go everywhere. And Skeletor attacks and brings everyone back to life. That shot of Man-at-Arms to the left, He-Man in centre and Orko is sadly misplaced, with Man-at-Arms being somewhat of a giant and also having his torso miscoloured. And even during daytime, Castle Greyskull looks so fantastic. It's crazy how good these backgrounds look, so atmospheric. This is one of the few times we get a really good look at these bizarre trees that surround the Castle Greyskull area. Eventually the backgrounds for the Evergreen Forest would become the surrounding area of Castle Greyskull, but here we can see that they were going for something rather unique. And look at this, how's this for an entrance with all the heroes racing to save the day? He-Man and Ram-Man and the Wind Raider, Stratos carrying man-at-arms and Orko just flying at speeds we didn't know he could even achieve. This is a really fun moment towards the end of the episode as we see the heroes teaming up to stop Colossal before he can gain access to Castle Greyskull because he does come close. Oh, interesting bit here. I've showcased before on the channel how Dusan Mitrovic has been able to locate missing pieces of dialogue that are oddly buried in the sound mix for episodes of the series. Well, although you cannot hear it in the episode, when Orko blinds Colossal, 
the giant roars. You can actually hear Lou Scheimer roar, but for some reason the roar is mixed incorrectly in the episode and we can barely hear it. And we see He-Man crushed by a great deal of rock, but I think we can all assume he's going to be okay because, as we've been told numerous times, he's the most powerful man in the universe. Now, watch this explosion carefully because I'm going to come back to it. I love that ad-libbing. My friend in Los Angeles and the original animation art collector, Lee Clevenger, whenever I'm visiting him, if we're driving around somewhere or we see something that makes us smile, we'll often drop in an, oh, right, yes, <laughs> into conversation. Very random. Oh, and in the final encounter with Skeletor, the script had the action staged so that when He-Man deflects Skeletor's final attack of the Collector, the beam was supposed to strike Skeletor, turning him to stone, and the Collector was to be destroyed. But, as we know, the Collector would come back, although it was never as threatening as it was in this episode. It basically became a means of transport for the villains throughout the series. Odd little scene in this, very much an early end to one of the earliest episodes. Going back to that explosion, if you go through it frame by frame, you'll see that there are actually tape marks all around it. Basically, this explosion was either mispositioned or, more than likely, taken from another animated explosion from another series and repositioned for this episode. I managed to get the entire effect sequence, and seeing the tape in person is really odd. Filmation knew it would show up on the screen, but it's so damn brief that people will always miss it. So yeah, Colossal Awakes. So much happens in this one episode than happens in two or three other episodes. As I mentioned earlier, it's kind of understandable if you get a little lost. The script is <laughs> as confusing as Skeletor's random attacks on the Royal Palace. There appears to be two or three individual stories taking place and, at times, it's hard to know which plot we are following. Even though the story features the heroes and villains travelling all over the planet with no sense of direction, the subplot with Colossor is enough to save the episode from being a convoluted disaster. This is one of those early episodes that makes us smile because I think it's so very closely associated with our nostalgia for the series. Heck, this episode was famously a part of the Panini sticker album. That in itself is enough to give it immunity from a harsh critique. And that's the end of this episode commentary. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please be sure to like, share and subscribe and I'll catch you on the next one.